Hey, AP Environmental Science, it's me, Mrs. Willis, and I am here to talk to you about a fascinating topic, which is water pollution. So we're going to go ahead and look at all the different types of water pollution that exist, give you some basic and background knowledge on that, and then take a look at what it does to the environment. So let's go ahead and dive in. The first thing that you should probably know is what is it, right? What is water pollution? So it's any physical, biological, or chemical change in the water that can affect the living organisms that are there or make the water unusable or unsuitable for purposes that are desired. So really that's a broad definition of what water pollution is, but it's really anything that changes the water to make it unusable or unfit. When you come upon a waterway, you might ask yourself, well, is this water polluted and how can you tell? Well, there are certain indicators that you can look for in a water source to see if it's polluted. Are there high levels of bacteria? Can you observe dead fish? Is there lots of algae growing? All of these indicate that there's something in the water that probably shouldn't be there. Also, take a look at some of the animals that exist there. Are there serious birth defects in the animals that you're looking at? Um, are there mutations that are present from these organisms? Another indicator may be if exotic species are present. That usually indicates that something's out of balance with the waterway. So you're looking right here, these are zebra mussels, and zebra mussels are an exotic species of the Great Lakes. This image here kind of shows you the spread. So that invasive species took over the Great Lakes and then it started spreading out through various waterways in the Midwest. And the reason why they're problems is because they do like to grow inside pipes and it clogs up a lot of the transportation plumbing that exists on the Great Lakes. There are two general categories for water pollutants. We have our point sources and our non-point sources. Point sources, kind of like the name says, can you point to where that water pollution is coming from? Because if you can, that is usually a point source. And so pipes and sewers that dump directly into specific places, those would all be point sources. Compare that to non-point sources. Non-point sources could be coming from a variety of areas. You can't really tell where it's coming from, rather just a larger area rather than a single point system. So non-point sources of water pollution would be things like mining waste or urban litter runoff or even agricultural runoff from farms of various areas. So now what we're going to do is look at the different types of water pollution, like the general categories that exist. Our first category is sediment pollution. Now sediment pollution is really just, if you wanna think about it, dirt being placed in the water or soil being placed in the water. And it is the largest pollutant by volume and it's usually being placed in the waterway because of erosion. Erosion is the process where soil particles are moved, usually by wind or water, into an area. And smaller particles tend to move more easily. That is because they're usually lighter and can be carried by the wind or the water. But remember, soil contains a lot of nutrients. So if it's eroding from, say, your farmland and it's going into the nearest waterway, then your land is actually losing a lot of nutrients. What is also really crazy is that scientists are starting to find out that coral reefs are actually very sensitive to sediment pollution. That is because it makes feeding more difficult because remember these, they kind of look like upside down little jellyfish. So they're using their tentacles to kind of capture food. And when there's a whole bunch of sediment in the water, it makes it very difficult. Also, they spend a lot of time trying to wipe the sediment away from themselves. So they waste energy to clean. Um, also sediment, 
if you just take a look at these pictures here, you'll see it's blocking a lot of the sunlight. And coral, they have this algae that lives inside of them called zooxanthellae. And if the sediment is blocking the sunlight, that algae can't photosynthesize, so it's not making sugars for that symbiosis in the coral. There are many ecological problems associated with sediment pollution. Number one, it reduces the light penetration in aquatic systems. And if there's less light, there's less photosynthesis, and that means there's less dissolved oxygen in the waterway. Also, sediment can transport toxic substances into the water. So as it's being eroded, it can carry away other materials and place them in the water. It also can fill waterways and wetlands and reservoirs, and all of these areas are habitat for organisms. And lastly, if you're losing a lot of nutrients from your soil because they're getting washed away or eroded away into a waterway, then you're probably going to have to use more fertilizers in order to keep those nutrients in the ground. So what is the number one way to keep sediment in place? Vegetate. If you plant things, those roots will grab hold of the soil and keep the soil in place. It will still erode, but not at the fast rates that we are seeing currently. The next category of water pollution is raw sewage. And raw sewage is untreated water material that's coming from the water pipes from industries or homes. Here in Los Angeles, we do have sewer lines that break. So our sewer lines deliver our wastewater to usually treatment plants and it gets cleaned and placed back in the ocean. But sometimes those sewer lines do break and it releases a lot of pathogens into the ground or surface water. Our third category is disease causing agents. There are many diseases that can be found in water, and these usually come from untreated human waste or animal waste that are being placed into the water. Um, that is usually created from a lack of general san sanitation in, or, in cities, and also um, just not having water treatment facilities in order to clean the water of these disease-causing agents. I like this chart here because it does show many of the pathogens that can be carried by raw sewage. So we have things like salmonella and E. coli and um, giardia. All of these are very serious water pollutants that can really harm humans if ingested. Our next category are the inorganic plant nutrients. And these are the nutrients that get placed in the water that do not contain carbon. So the most common ones that you're gonna find in a waterway are nitrates and phosphates. And these two primarily cause what is known as eutrophication. And eutrophication is excessive al algal growth. <laughs> An example of algal growth that's happening in our area, actually just last week, is something called a red tide. And so this is an algal bloom of organisms that are called dinoflagellates that live in the water. So when they get an excess of nutrients, they bloom. And then what's kind of cool though, is that when they crash on the beach at night, they glow. So here are some pictures of the glow. So this is a red tide at night. So these little dinoflagellates, when they're shaken, they bioluminesce, and you get to see this lovely color at night. So how do you get eutrophication to occur? So how do you get that excessive algae growing? Um, the first thing, you gotta put nutrients like nitrate and phosphate into the water. The primary sources of those two tend to be fertilizers that are being used on farms. Once those go into the water, the algae, they take them up. They love them. They're often limiting factors in an environment. So when they get them, they start growing and blooming. However, as that bloom progresses, the algae is gonna start dying because they are going to run out of nutrients because they are overpopulating themselves. When they die, they sink down to the bottom of the waterway. This dead organic material, it actually 
reports a boom or a growth in the detritivore populations. What is a detritivore? It's an organism that eats detritus or this dead organic material. So good examples would be shrimp and worms. They are common detritivores and what they do because they are aerobic organisms, they require oxygen, they will rob the waterway of its oxygen, suffocating most organisms like fish. And the reason that happens is because their population explodes because they're getting this huge source of food, which is the dead algae that sank to the bottom. So when you see massive fish kills like this, that is usually what happens. Next up, we have our organic compounds. So these are materials that contain carbon. The most common one that you're gonna find in our waterway is oil. And so in 1989, we had a huge oil spill in Alaska where the Exxon Valdez tanker spilled its oil into Prince William Sound. Here is a diagram of the worst oil spills that we've had in history you can see there have been numerous oil spills that have taken place around the world. Another organic compound that we're seeing a lot in our waterways now are plastics. So plastics are technically made from oil, right? And so these are going into the waterway as well. So we can't forget about the heavy metals. Heavy metals can be found in our waterways. Some common examples are mercury and cadmium, nickel and lead. Mercury tends to come from coal burning. Lead tends to come from leaded pipes or back in the day leaded gasoline. And then mining waste actually introduces a ton of metals into the water. The problem with heavy metals is they are fat soluble. They're stored in our fats and they can bioaccumulate through the food chain. So that means things higher up on the food chain tend to get sick because they are um, ingesting large amounts of heavy metals. In 1932, there was actually a, uh, an event that happened where people were ingesting large amounts of mercury. Um, there was a company called the Chizo Corporation in Minimata, Japan, and they were making a chemical called acetaldehyde. Well, mercury was a byproduct of this process and the company decided to discharge it into the bay. So at first, um, the fish and the cats were acting a little strange. And then um, people started noticing the humans were acting a little bit different than what they usually were. So they had a loss of motor control. There was paralysis. Um, people couldn't walk right. It wasn't until 1963 that scientists were able to track the mercury poisoning back to the Chizo Corporation. What they found was that bacteria in the water, they were taking that mercury that was being dumped by the Chizo Corporation and turning it into a soluble type of mercury called methylmercury. Fish were then able to take that up through their gills and it bioaccumulated through that ocean food chain all the way up to humans because humans were eating that fish. The Chizo Corporation, they were forced to clean up the bay and pay the victims $86 million and seven, approximately 1,800 people died because of the poisoning. Our next category is thermal pollution. Thermal pollution is when you raise or lower the temperature of the water. This tends to happen from industrial plants that are located near a waterway. They often take up this cold water to use it to cool off their plants. And when they put it back into the water, the water is warmer than what it was. Why is this a problem? It tends to lower the dissolved oxygen levels in the water. Um, colder water can actually hold more oxygen than warmer water. And also organisms can experience thermal shock. If you change that temperature of the water very suddenly, it can lead to the death of organisms that are in there. 
And lastly, we have our urban runoff, which is really composed of a whole bunch of different pollutants that we talked about today. And a good example of urban runoff is litter. So litter usually comes from urban areas and it runs off with the water and is placed in larger waterways. It tends to be ingested by animals and it, it does have the tendency to break up into little pieces, which makes it easier for animals to ingest. And we have seen this numerous times with with turtles. Also, um, albatrosses, which are these birds you see here on the bottom right, they are found, they have been found to ingest a lot of plastics and they create these things called a bolus. Um, what albatrosses do is they regurgitate or vomit um, indigestible food. And then scientists notice if we take these and we open them up, they were finding tons of plastic pieces in the bolus. So it's just another example of water pollutants that are affecting the environment. All right, everyone, that concludes our talk. I hope this was helpful and um, try to keep that water clean. Bye, everyone.